Hello and good morning. Hey, good morning. This is Francis Perry Williams. How are you doing today? All right. It's, it's, I'm in, over here in Idaho, uh, which is uh, near, near Coeur d'Alene, uh, which is the, <laughs> a lot of, you know, no snow right now, but it's a little, you know, it's definitely a different kind of weather. Uh, I originally am from San, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Venice Beach, so this is a different kind of we- uh, life for me. <laughs> Absolutely. I grew up in the state of Montana, and we would go right by Coeur d'Alene Lake to get our, to get our tails over there to Seattle. Oh, then you know where I'm. You know where I'm at. I absolutely know where you're at. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm right next to. I'm literally uh, Hayden is right next to Coeur d'Alene. Oh man, is that, that and that's that to me. That's the world's longest lake. I mean, because you just you drive it and it's it's still there. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I live out in the boondocks a little bit because I'm like uh, oh about ten minutes out, about fifteen minutes out of town. I'm on about about twelve acres. And I have lots of trees and animals and deer and horses. And I even have a bald eagle in my front yard and a a big tree in the nest. Nice, nice. Hey, as we get started today, the first thing I want to do is I want to thank you for serving our nation in Vietnam. Oh, yes. (laughs) I remember. (laughs) But it was funny how, uh, you know, uh, when I first got back from Vietnam, people just did not like the Vietnam veterans. Boy, they... Uh, at the airport, they would they would jeer at us, and, yeah. and you know, like when I wore my uniform and everything. So it's it's a it's a better change now. People respect them now better than they did back then. Absolutely, absolutely. Did you pull from any of those stories of of experience uh, to put a book like this together? No, uh, I mean, I mean, I guess so. I guess everything is my life experience. Uh, yeah. Uh, my my first book, uh, which was called uh, "Pollen and the Ring of Harmony," uh, was about an. Um, alien who is a protector of nature throughout mm. the universe so he goes from planet to planet to, uh, warning each planet that they are they have a disregard for nature he's not a, a climate uh, activist he's just nature and like he says that a life has to have a circle and sometimes uh, humans don't understand that there's a circle of life and so when we build a parking lot we're taking uh, uh, the homes from animals so we have to be aware that you know i'm not trying to be crazy but i say we have to be aware that they have a life too <laughs> wow the name of the book is saving christ starway seven this is a science fiction meets religion tell me about this where did this come from inside that imagination of yours well, what happened was I was in my office and I was cleaning out, cleaning out my uh, uh, desk and suddenly this National Geographic fell on the floor. <laughs> and on it was a, a, a cover of Jesus. And the, the captain said, the real Jesus. And I said to myself, what would Jesus be like if he was, if you knew him as a real person? Yeah. And I said, no, that's not possible, but in fiction it is. So I said, no, wait a minute. The only way to really, truly know Jesus would be able would be to go back in time and see him as a real person. And I said, well, what an idea for a story, because no one's ever thought of that before. Yeah. I mean, I said, wow, this is going to be something that I, maybe I can work with. And it, it happened so quick. I mean, uh, the first thing I did, Errol, is that I did about six months of, uh, you, know, you know, review on Jesus, and I, I learned everything about him, and then... The whole book, 114,000 words, only took three months to write. It's just like it was like in me. It's like, and I'm not that religious of a person. And yeah. the book is not. Is, the book is not a religious book. It is a book about a person from our time being sent back in time to be with Jesus for his last seven days. Wow. Now, the, in my book, Jennifer, the main character, she does fall in love with Jesus, and Jesus does fall in love with her. But it's a pure and, and simple love. There's no sex in my book, and also I adhere to the Bible. Even though it, it, it is not a religious book, it does adhere to the Bible. So everything that happens in the Bible happens in my book, as it should happen. Except now you get to see it through the perspective of a modern-day woman. I, I love the twist idea of, of sending back an FBI agent. I mean, to go back there to kind of figure out what's going wrong here. I mean, and, and then again, it could have been right. But, I mean, I love the idea of stepping back there because I'll bet you we've all thought of that. What would it be like if I could go back and do it? And you give us that opportunity. Yes. And uh, my whole idea, this, this whole concept was made to be a movie. I mean, uh, that's what I want. I mean, uh, uh, everything I write is, is, is made to be a movie anyway. In fact, uh, like I said, if you go back in my history, I even wrote an episode of a 
uh, show called Laverne and Shirley, which may be even <laughs> yes. before your time. No, no, no. So, it was. Uh, I was yeah. there. I was there. <laughs> and I actually uh, did a couple episodes of uh, uh, acting in, uh, you know, Happy Days, yeah. where I, I knew the Fonz and all those guys back then, uh, Robin Williams, and... Uh, and also a show called Booze and Buddies with yes. Tom Hanks. Yeah, yeah. So to, to jump into this style of storytelling versus the sitcom style, what, how did you grow from that to go into a long-form kind of style? Well, I've always wanted... One of the things that people like about me, about my writing, is that uh, I write as if people speak. A lot of times writers want to want to write things that are beautiful yep. and poetic, and, but... People don't speak that way, Errol. I mean, people speak like you and I are speaking. And so I, I wanted to write a story uh, like that where people could actually, it, it sounded real. It sounded like, you know, hey, this is what how people and Jesus would talk like. I mean, one of my famous old authors was Ernest Hemingway because he had a way of writing where it sounded elegant but it was real yeah yeah you know what that mark twain talked about that he said that one thing that he could teach any all authors would be to use your authentic voice don't don't try to become somebody else's accent use your own accent when you're writing right but i wanted like a lot of people ask me uh how did I come up with this idea they said it's so unique and, yeah. come, and nobody's ever thought about it before and because uh i i wanted to make uh you know my main goal was to make a new story out of the greatest story ever told. I mean, I wanted it to appeal to the audience that we have today, uh, Errol, and not just be a rerun of the thousands of stories already told That's about right. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And like I said, the only way to really find the truth would be to go back in time and observe, observe it as it happened. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to write a 2,000-year-old contemporary love story about Jesus with total respect to the Bible, but I also wanted to show the human love side of Jesus, which has never been done before, because, you know, Jesus was half human, yeah. and I wanted, you know, I didn't want the God side, I wanted the, the, the Jesus side, and like I said, my book is not about Jesus, it's about how Jesus affects Jennifer, my main character, and also how Jesus affects the people around him, because I was saying that, you know, Listen, I'm not that super religious, but you have to respect Jesus. He's the most known person yep. on planet Earth right now. I mean, if you go around the world, er anywhere you want to go, they all know who Jesus is or was. Uh, and so what he did in only 33 years is amazing. He, he didn't write any books. He, he didn't seek fame or fortune. Right. Yet what he seemed to do seemed impossible, but he did it. He changed the world and created a whole new religion. Yeah. I mean, you know, we all, even now, we learn about what he's done. Like, for instance, his saying, do not judge others as you would not be judged. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, and those are just a few of them, but he, you know, he really affected us. And, and even though he, uh, you know, even without religion, you could, you could uh, you know, appreciate Jesus. Now, in a real kind of creative way, would Jennifer, if Jennifer goes back in time, would she become a part of the Bible then? Because, I mean, if, you know, it was always written about his, his story. If she becomes a part of his life, wouldn't, wouldn't she also appear in the Bible? Okay, here's what happens. Back <laughs> in those days, uh, the Bible was written by men. That's and right. They didn't care that much. You know, oh, women were considered to be second-rate citizens. Yep, and so yep. even, uh, you know, there's very little written about Mary Magdalene because she was a woman. Yep. Uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, the, the people try to say that was a love interest. No, uh, what, what Jesus did, he, that he saved her from seven demons. She had problems with demons. And she helped support Jesus financially. She had a little extra money. And her and her, a few of her friends supported Jesus. But back in those days, women were not considered, you know, writable. Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So no matter what would have happened, even if Jen Jennifer would be part of the Bible, they wouldn't, they wouldn't write about her. Yeah, yeah. So d have any religious groups come up and knocked on your door saying, hey, w w what are you doing here, dude? Well, actually, I've had a couple of religious calls, and I said, you know, they said, Perry, after reading the book, uh, you're not. You're not blasphemous. You're, you're actually right on the Great. Bible. You, you make it sound even better. And so, actually, uh, religious people will like my book, if I can get them to read it. Uh, it is uh, something that, you know, 
it's different for them. And uh, it's, it's kind of like the anti-Da Vinci Code, uh, where it, it, it's a story about the Bible, but it isn't religious. Yeah, 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 yeah. To go into that deep uh, personality as a writer, do, do you spend hours on that computer, or what are you doing? Because, I mean, I, mean, I, I, there, I only allow myself so much time to be inside this studio. What about you as that writer? Because you, you're deep. Okay, I have a system of writing that I can only write from early evening to late at night. So I wrote uh, Saving Christ, R.A. 7, uh, from like 8 o'clock at night to about 2 to 3 in the morning. <laughs> and there were some times when I could do 4 and 5 at night. <laughs> and uh, like I said, it just uh, it was like it was already written, Errol. I mean, I mean, I sat there and I could just type it down as fast as I could, and it just came out so fast. I don't know why. I mean, uh, once I get into something, I, I start thinking about it. And, and how I do, Errol, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like make up words. I make up images in my mind as if they actually happen. Yes. So in my mind right now, Saving Christ, Starway 7 already happened, and it, it's real. And so I just, you know, hyped it down. So it's a form of stream thinking for you. Yes. Yeah, see, I love that. I love that. I wish more people believed in that process. I mean, to me, it's the real thing. I mean, all my stories. Uh, I have, a, I have a, a beautiful little story I wrote called Rex. And it, it's about a, a young girl, 12 years old, uh, in Montana, and, and she goes inside an ice cave, and this lightning storm happens, and all of a sudden, in front of her is a, is a, a large egg about three foot in diameter. <laughs> and this is a comedy, but the egg hatches in front of her, and it's a baby T-Rex. Oh, man. Now, the baby T-Rex <laughs> looks at Jennifer and, like a duck, thinks that she is his mother and won't let her out of his sight. Love it. Love so it. So it's a comedy. So yeah, I, I think of things like that. <laughs> I love it. Where can people go to find out more about you and to dive into all of your writing? Well, you, you know, I, you know, I have my, well, right now I have a, a website called jctimetravel.com. And, of course, all my books are still on Amazon. And, uh, you know, and I'm, you know, like I said, it's a rough, rough call. You, you have to, even if you have something that's really a good idea, you have to find, people have to find out about it. Yep. And uh, it's so hard. I mean, you know, it's like writing a book was the easy part. Trying to sell the book is the most <laughs> difficult part you could imagine. I mean, I spent years trying to sell my other books, and I met people like Ray Liotta, the actor who just recently died, yes. uh, backed me up. And even that didn't work. Wow, wow. And that's every bit the reason why I created the podcast, View from the Writing Instrument, because it's time for authors to talk about their stories and sell some dang books. Well, yes. And also, I, I, I truly believe, Errol, that my book can help a lot of people because it can, get a, it can give the ordinary person who doesn't even care about Jesus yeah. an idea of what Jesus was like. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said before, lo love him or hate him, he had such good things about him that we have lost in our world. Like a lot of times in my book, uh, you know, you know my, my work, I go back in time, so you have, you have no phones, you have no internet, you have no, you have no TV. So people had to speak to each other back then, yep. like really speak. And we have lost that now. We, in fact, you know, you know, young kids, they speak to their phones more than they speak <laughs> to anybody else. So true. And so I wanted to show that, that you know, we have lost our, our, our ability to communicate with each other. And I think that's very important. Absolutely. You got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Well, thank you, Errol. I really appreciate it. You know, thank you. And, uh, I, uh, you sound like you, you you've been you, you kind of understand you understand what I'm trying to do. I absolutely do. Totally, 100. percent And I'm not trying. You know, like I said, uh, people have told me this would be the, the most worldwide movie they could ever think of. It would have an audience of of a billion people, but it would just show the love and the you know the value that Jesus had. And not even not even be religious, just yeah. the love. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Period. Excellent. And, and I, I, have a, I have a saying that no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, if you know Jesus, you know love. And unfortunately, Errol, I mean, we have lost a lot of love in this world today. Everybody is out for everything else but love. So true, so true. And I'm not talking about, you know, love between a man and a woman, just simple love for you each bet. other. You're so like, true. Like Jesus said, do unto, do unto others as you would do unto yourself. Simple. And I really appreciate you listening to me and giving me a chance. You bet. Well, you be brilliant today. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. All right, Errol. Uh, thank you very, very much.